immediately after the start, the Olympic steeplechaser took the lead to pace Bannister for the first half mile. Chatterway's lying in third position. The race was run at Oxford as part of a meeting between the Amateur Athletic Association and Oxford University. The first lap was about 58, but I didn't feel it at all. I, I hardly felt I was running, and uh, it wasn't until about the three-quarter mile, mile, by which time uh, Chris Chatterway was then leading, that I began to feel the strain of it. We heard the lap time, and it was just on three minutes. So uh, I had to manage the last lap in under 60 seconds. With 250 yards to go, 25-year-old Bannister took the lead with an amazing burst of speed. He went on to achieve the world record of a mile in under four minutes, sought after by athletes for over 40 years. His time was three minutes, 59.4 seconds. It was only when they made the announcement, a track, uh, British, Commonwealth, uh, European, and then world record, and the time was three minutes, and the rest of the announcement was drowned in the noise. Since the 6th of May, 1954, the day Roger Bannister became the first man to run a mile in under four minutes to the present, 11 athletes have bettered or lowered the world mile record. Each has taken a unique talent, fusing it with discipline in a ruthless determination to succeed. Each has learned to live with physical pain, accompany fear, and to risk the unknown. Each has attained international celebrity. From Roger Bannister to Steve Cram, these are the super milers, the 12 members of one of the most elite clubs in world sport. Just 46 days after Roger Bannister became the first man to break four minutes for a mile, the world record was lowered by a further one and a half seconds. The new holder, Australian John Landy. On the 7th of August, 1954, in Vancouver, Canada, in the Empire Games one mile final, the only two sub four minute milers in world athletics, Roger Bannister and John Landy, were to meet head-on for the first and only time. The strong favourite, Landy. It's still Landy, followed by Bannister, with the rest strung out behind. Bannister's been taking it calmly up till now, but he's beginning to close on the Aussie. This isn't his famous final burst yet. The finish is still a long way off. Slowly, steadily, and very surely, Bannister's closing on Landy. Only 400 yards to go. And now Bannister begins his finishing burst. 100 yards to the line, and he's passing Landy. I looked up, and there was about 80 metres to go, and there was Roger in front of me, and I tried to make it up, but I couldn't, and he got to the line first. I think of all the recollections I've got of Roger Bannister, that would be the strongest. Bannister falls almost senseless into waiting arms. That last fantastic burst sapped every ounce of energy from him. His time of three minutes, 50. I was a front runner, and my experience in Australia was running very much on my own. Without making any excuses, I don't think I really had any other way to run. There was nobody else in the race. I felt I had to take the lead. And my plan was very simple, and that was to run Roger Bannister into the ground if I could. And um, I think I went fairly close to it. I just wasn't quite good enough.
Yorkshire, the rugged north of England. Its harsh winter weather is reflected in the grit and character of its people, especially its sportsmen, names like Jeff Boycott, Harvey Smith, and one of the best loved athletes Britain has ever produced, Derek Ibbotson. For almost two decades, until he retired in the late 1960s, Derek Ibbotson trained around the roads and hilly streets of Huddersfield, where he was born and still lives today. The determination uh, from my Yorkshire background, obviously living in Huddersfield, which is a you know, very, very tough place to live with lots of hills and quite cold weather, you get a lot of stamina, lots of strength and lots of determination because you know, living is harder than it is in the South. This thing about Yorkshire grit and determination comes to you very early when you, you're, you're hearing about the, the cricket, the Yorkshire cricketers and, and, and the footballers and, and other athletes in this area. And so when you, you get into this position, you think, well, you know, I'm supposed to be very gritty and very determined, so I'm going to have to be. And it does help. At the White City Stadium, London, on the 19th of July, 1957, in front of a capacity crowd and a field of the world's top milers, Derek Ibbotson was to run the most important race of his career, a race that would carry his reputation as an athlete for the next decade. But Derek Ibbotson, number 71, steadily overtakes him. Now he's passed and pounding ahead at the top of it, looking more like a half miler than a miler. This is the stuff records are made of, and the car's pretty sure another one's on the way. And they're not disappointed. Yards ahead of Delaney and the check, Ibbotson streaks for the tape to smash the world record by nearly a second in three minutes, 57.2. The difference between my day and the present day is, of course, they are full-time, um, not, well, so let's say, professional. They are full-time athletes. They do nothing else but athletics. I mean, I have run at White City for Great Britain when I finished work at lunchtime here in Yorkshire, taking the train down to London, taking the underground to White City, got there at 6 o'clock. I've been out on the track at 8 o'clock running for Great Britain. <laughs> Portsea, Australia, rolling white sand dunes facing the Southern Ocean. It was on these very dunes 25 years ago that one of the greatest middle distance runners of all time was deeply committed to a new style, a new technique of training, a total way of life pioneered by the legendary Australian coach, Percy Serity. The runner's name, Herb Elliott, known as the Invincible, a runner who achieved it all and retired undefeated. I think I was probably the most intense trainer that, uh, that I've come across in athletics in my time or even today. And I think that's one of the reasons why I retired so early. My training was incredibly intense and it was the way I raced intensely and that's why I think I was never beaten. Herb Elliott broke the world mile record in Dublin, Ireland on the 6th of August 1958, cutting a huge margin of almost three seconds off Derek Ibbotson's year-old mark. Although taking on all comers from all corners of the world, Elliot was never beaten in the 36 mile races he ran and went on to break the four minute barrier a total of 17 times. The miracle mile to end all miracle miles. Marvel at the wonderfully calm way he takes this, his greatest race. It's the eighth time Elliot's run a four minute mile. At this time, it's well below four minutes. Three minutes, 54.5. I never really went into uh, a mile with a sense of communion and invincibility. I always had that sense of fragility about me that uh, uh, gave me that little touch of nervousness and doubt that made me run a hell of a lot faster. Herb Elliott's single greatest race was at the 1960 Rome Olympics, where he annihilated the opposition to win the 1500 metre gold medal by 20 metres. On that day, Herb Elliott was truly invincible in a class and race of his own. In fact, his time was so fast, it would have beaten Sebastian Coe's winning 1500 metre time at the Moscow Olympics by almost three seconds. Up to the take charge, Elliot, a good 15 yards ahead of Gazi, Rosavolgi third. 
people could say that at 22 years of age, I had the world in front of me and I could have perhaps set the mile record three or four seconds further back than I did. But people who say that, uh, I don't know whether they're stupid, but they certainly don't understand that to be a mile runner is not just a matter of your physical performance, it's a matter of, uh, of your hunger to succeed, it's, uh, it's a matter of you feeling good about it and wanting to do it. And if you lose any of those ingredients, then you're at your top. And I, in fact, stopped at my peak, which is the right time to stop. Health and Science University of Texas is today the sanctuary of the athlete who was to snatch Herb Elliott's world mile record and 1500 meter Olympic title. A brilliant all-round sportsman from New Zealand, the Iron Man, Peter Snell. Snell's place in athletic history is secure through his string of records and titles. He twice broke the world mile record. He broke the world half mile and 1,000 meter records and won three Olympic gold medals, including the 800 and 1,500 meter double in Tokyo in 1964, an achievement which still eludes today's best athletes. In fact, Peter Snell never lost when a major title was at stake. Not everyone needs to have the so-called killer instinct. And there are many athletes who have a different approach to this, and this might best be summed up by saying it is more fear of losing. Uh, once uh, a runner has a reputation, and that reputation goes on the line, you become concerned that someone else is going to sort of beat you and maybe sort of diminish that, uh, that status that you've acquired to build up. And so it's a slightly different uh, approach to the idea of actually wanting to destroy your opponent. Nothing illustrates Peter Snell's unique blend of power and sustained speed better than one of his great performances in Modesto, California, where he ran the fastest mile ever in the United States. His reputation as the Iron Man was to ride the test of time. Peter Snell will be remembered as one of the truly great super milers. Paris is a city that places its idols on a high pedestal, particularly sportsmen. Few Frenchmen have made it internationally in the field of athletics. In the past 50 years, only one has ever broken the world mile record and achieved genuine world supremacy in middle distance running. A man who in the mid-1960s was a French folk hero and to this day still commands wide national respect. His name? Michel Jarzy. A master against the clock, but failing to win a gold medal in three Olympic Games, when usually the favorite, Jazzy's greatest race was the night he lowered Peter Snell's world mile record in Rennes, France, in front of his legion of passionate French supporters. Michel Jarzy will always be remembered for his seven world records and for his precision running style, that smooth, relaxed action that dominated an era in the mid-1960s. Lawrence, Kansas is a small agricultural community in middle America, strong Ronald Reagan country. It is also the home of a celebrated middle distance runner, probably the greatest America's ever produced. 
At the age of 19, he shattered the world mile record by over two seconds, and overnight became the first athlete to attain pop celebrity status. It was the era of the Beatles and the swinging 60s. Young success was the vogue, and Jim Ryan from Kansas was the man out front, the new generation of super athlete, the miler to beat. The 17th of July, 1966, the venue, Berkeley, California. Ryan went to the front, setting a blistering pace, too hot for the rest of the All-American field. His target, to beat Frenchman Michel Jazzy's world best of three minutes, 53.6. Bearing along for an incredible last lap time of 56.3, Magnificent Ryan shattered the world mile record. Until the summer of 1968, Jim Ryan had achieved everything. He twice shattered the world mile record, eventually lowering it to 3 minutes 51.1 seconds. He bettered Herb Elliott's already outstanding 1500 meter record by a huge margin of over two seconds. He also claimed the world half mile record. Only one important goal remained, an Olympic gold medal. America expected it of him. But the Olympic Games would have haunt Jim Ryan. First Mexico in 1968, the 1500 meters final. He was mercilessly criticized by the press for running a tactically poor race, leaving his final sprint far too late and coming in second to Kip Kano for the silver medal. The high altitude of Mexico was blamed. Four years later in Munich, Having trained harder than ever before, he was tripped and fell in an early heat and never even made the final. Heartbroken, bitter, Jim Ryan gave up the fight. To this day, he has never really recovered. Munich was a terribly difficult situation for me, not so much because of the fall. I fell in the earliest round of competition. I was bumped by another runner later in the competition, a day later, they would show videos that I was indeed fouled. And you always know as a result of international competition, because it's kind of a, a bump tassel sort of thing at different times, that there's that opportunity to get bumped and even fall in a race. So that, that wasn't the hard part for me. The hard part would come about 24 hours later when the International Olympic Committee, having looked at those films, would simply say, that's too controversial. We don't want to do anything. Come back in four years and try again. Now, I'm paraphrasing that a bit. But in essence, that's what they said. After the shattering experience of Munich, Jim Ryan is back in training, putting in over 100 miles a week on the very same Kansas roads that took him to those peaks of success and glory in the mid-1960s. Jim Ryan's love of running is again a motivating force in his life. In the 50-year history of the mile, only one African has ever broken the world record, Philbert Bailly, the mountain man who trained in the hills of Tanzania and who dominated middle distance running in the mid-1970s. Bailly never had the advantage of specialist coaching. His track, his gymnasium, his weight training was against the natural terrain of his homeland. You know, to beat Sebastian Coe, or to beat uh, Ovet, or to beat John Walker, or to beat uh, Steve uh, Steve Crown, you have to have speed. Otherwise, with no speed, you better not compete. I know, I understand that. You know, they will kill. I mean, they will kill. Bai exploded into the forefront of world athletics at Christchurch, New Zealand, at the 1974 Commonwealth Games, where he took the 1500 meter gold medal, beating John Walker and Ben Jipko, and also setting a new world record. One year later, in 1975, Bai snatched Jim Ryan's eight-year-old world mile record in Jamaica. They come now, Tanzania's Philbert Bai had won the dream mile. Philbert Bai become the world number one. Whatever future success lies ahead for Philbert Bai, his immortality is secure as the only African to break the world mile and 1500 meter records something even the other great African runners, Kip Kano and Mike Boyd, were never able to achieve.
The joy of running free has never been better expressed than on this open expanse of rolling dunes on the Tasman Sea on the northern coast of New Zealand. This is the training ground of one of the most charismatic middle distance runners of all time. A runner who popularized athletics as much through his personality and physical appeal as through his immense achievements on the track. His name, John Walker, the first athlete ever to run a mile in under three minutes, 50 seconds. It's the 12th of July, 1975. The venue, Gothenburg, Sweden. I'd gone over and over in my mind so many times how many times I was going to run that race. I mean, all I, I didn't think about winning, I thought about breaking the world record. I had 10 hours just sitting in the bedroom, getting up, sleeping, watching the wind, watching the flags. I mean, this was all a part of the race. I imagined myself in my mind coming down the last 120 metres all the time. And this was my final victory. I mean, this was my day. I mean, I was absolutely ecstatic because I, I knew as soon as I crossed the line, the reaction from the crowd, the reaction from the press, that I had broken the world record. I didn't know I'd run under 350 and it was only, I was travelling with a journalist by the name of Ivan Agnew who was also writing a book called Kiwis Can Fly at the time. And it was only when he sort of thrust a watch under my uh, face and said, you've broken 3.50. I had no idea what the time was. And they did another time, 3.49.6. It wasn't until I got back to the hotel room, I mean, all the adulation had died down, the three victory laps, the flowers, the kisses, I mean, the, the waving to the crowd, I mean, all that had gone. And it wasn't until I got back to the hotel room and settled down with a couple of beers that the phone started ringing from all over the world. Then I realised what I'd done. One year after becoming the first man on earth to run a mile in under three minutes, 50 seconds, John Walker confirmed his place in history as one of the all-time great middle distance runners. It's Montreal, 1976, the last lap of the Olympic Games 1500 meter final. Walker puts on a display of majestic power running and takes the gold medal. No one cares about second or third. If you can take the silver medal and, or the bronze medal and look at games, no one really cares. I mean, the gold medal is the pinnacle. I mean, it's the answer. No one really writes about second or third. It's the champion is the person who wins, and the person that can stave off and beat the best in the world. Winning is everything. If you don't win, I mean, you're nothing. And the adulation and the publicity that came from breaking 350 was probably four times more than ever winning the Olympic gold. I wasn't expected to run under 350 for the mile. I was expected to win the Olympic gold medal. But I think winning the gold medal really captured and captivated the whole career. I mean, 1976, my career basically finished, although I'm still running today, because I had reached the pinnacle of anyone's career. I had broken two world records. I had run under 350 for the mile. And finally, I won the Olympic gold medal. I couldn't do any more in my life.
I'm not as experienced at running miles or 1500 meters as a lot of uh, my compatriots. And, and certainly I'd run probably fewer miles or 1,500 metres before I actually broke the world record, and I would have thought anybody in the history of the sport. Poe at the bell, he's going to be ahead of the field, he looks over his shoulder, the time at the bell is 2.53, they're not only on to a great race here, but we're on to a very, very fast time, if Poe can finish with the same sort of strength and aggression that he did as he takes Scott on this last lap, we could be on for a world record even. It's Coe now, eight, nine yards in front of Steve Scott, the American, and yards and yards in front of the rest of the field, who are bunching in pursuit, they're sorting out, but really it's a matter of strength. It's Coe now against the clock, and all of the field could be on for a very fast time, but it's Sebastian Coe really making the rest of this field look very, very pedestrian. He's looking round, but he must be confident. A slight grimace, but he's so relaxed and he's coming away all down this field. Now they're waking up in the pack behind, but it's too late, they're forgotten. Cole's got time to look around, the crowd are rising at the time, extremely fast. Very near that world record, 3.49.4 it was, and he's underneath it. It's a new world record for Sebastian Cole. His second in 12 days, a phenomenal run, a fraction of a second under, 3.49. Another barrier broached by this remarkable young man. 22 years old and he has the world now when Sebastian Coe broke John Walker's world mile record on the 17th of July 1979 in Oslo Norway a new track idol was born a new era of middle distance running was about to begin while Seb Coe was the man of the moment hovering in his shadow was another explosive highly talented Englishman a middle distance runner whose moment as a miler was soon to come his name Steve Ovet if a person is better than the last world record holder or the last Olympic champion, then his times will automatically progress and uh, we set the target for the next person or the next generation. I mean, so in that sense, we never really achieve perfection. We just uh, keep climbing up the ladder, I suppose. And Steve Oslo, Norway, the 1st of July, 1980. Really beginning to show the class of runner that he is. He's still looking so relaxed. He doesn't look at all under pressure. He looks even more relaxed, possibly, than Coe did at this stage last year. Very even, being encouraged all the way down the back straight. The crowd are banging on the sides. They're clapping, they're chanting in time with his running. He's got to run this last lap in around 57 seconds to break what is almost an unbeatable world record. Steve Obeck now coming round. Has he relaxed too much? He looks too relaxed at this stage. He surely isn't running fast enough to break the world record. And yet he's a tenth of a second faster than Cole was at the 1500 metre mark. It's all down to this last 80 metres now and he's staying with it. But he looks so relaxed, it's going to be desperately close. 3.49 the time to beat, 3.49 the existing record and he's inside it. 3.48.8, Ovet takes the world record from his greatest rival, Sebastian Cole. I think the greatest winners of the greatest uh, competitors are people that know defeat. They don't, they're not frightened of it. They know it. They know it so well that um, they don't want any part of it. Some of the American psychologists believe in terms of sport that uh, you've got to actually go out and enjoy it and feel good feelings towards your competitors and all this sort of stuff. Well, I'm perhaps not quite as sold on that in the heat of battle. Down the back straight, Between July 1979 and August 1981, Steve Ovet and Sebastian Coe break the world mile record five times between them. Three to Coe and two to Ovet, climaxing with Coe's magnificent run of three minutes, 47.3 seconds in Brussels on the 28th of August, 1981. And now we'll see the time to beat. 3.48.4, the world record is the time to beat. And Boyd is still hanging in there. And Coe coming in, the crowd are cheering him on. It's a wonderful run, it's unbelievable. It's a second inside the world record. It's absolutely superlative running. Absolutely superlative running. He's turning around, trying to see the time on the scoreboard. A phenomenal run. The world record is regained by Sebastian Coe again tonight. And the rest of the world's milers finish in his wake, and nobody even noticed them. <laughs> That's nice. Very good. Give me that again. And again, yeah. Try and keep that arm down a little bit if you can, your left arm. All right, one, two, three. Yeah, it's good. OK.
Steve Ovett and Sebastian Coe epitomized the modern athlete. Gone is the era of a world-class miler fitting in training around a full-time job. Today, to have any real chance of reaching the top, an athlete's commitment must be total. The most modern facilities and training techniques have become a necessity. Hours of painful dedication in isolated daily training is normal. And to be scheduled, the commercial considerations. Capitalizing on the celebrity, the name and public image. Only a mere handful make it to this level. Sebastian Coe and Steve Ovet are at the pinnacle, among the most popular and in-demand track athletes anywhere in the world. Household names, yet far more complex people in reality than the public image might project. Well, I'm a very cold individual, um, always have been, very analytical, very, um, very cold, very unemotional about all situations. That's my greatest asset, I, um, I don't flap. Fear was as big a reason why I came back in 1980, having lost the 800 metres. I just didn't want to go into obscurity. I wanted to win because it was my life and I didn't like having something that I was very good at taken away from me. Despite being the two top middle distance runners in world athletics in the late 1970s and early 1980s, Sebastian Coe and Steve Ovet have only met on the track in the last five years at the Moscow and Los Angeles Olympics. As they're down the back straight, he's coming down the outside. Steve Ovet's coming out into a much better position. He doesn't want to get trapped, and he sets off. And the race is really on for the line. And it's Kirov who's decided to go, and Ovet's in there with him. And Coe is in fifth place and coming around the outside like a steam train. He's past Wagenknecht, and Grimaras won't be able to respond to him. Kirov is going off the front. Ovet's got him on his sights, and now Coe coming up behind. And Ovet hits the front, and he's got to keep those arms moving. Coe coming through into third place, fighting with the Brazilians. But Ovet's got five or six meters. And Ovet's going to take it easily. It was a slow run race, and he came through and he kicked decisively. Ovet first, Co second, Kirov third. The time 145.4. The last 200 meters of 25.2 seconds. And Steve... I woke up the following morning. I, I, I felt dreadful. Um, in fact, I went out on the road for a ra for a training session. I ran about 10 or 12 miles. It was shadowed the whole distance of the course by uh, British photographers. Um, and then, during the following week, newspapers arrived at the uh, at the village, and the caption above the photograph of me out on the road was Coe's trail of shame." So I realised then that um, you know that I had, luckily, a few days to get myself together. And I I also took solace in the fact that had I been Jim Ryan in 1972, my games would have been over. Now they're in single file, Straub of East Germany, Seb Coe, Steve Ovet, and Busser from East Germany. Busser not looking too comfortable in fourth place, but he could become a danger. The pace still pushing along. Marajo of France moves up into fifth place. Co still sat back there. Ovet is watching him all the way down the back straight. Ovet beginning to wind up now, ready for a strike. Yes, he's going to be ready to take Co as they go into the bend and trap Co behind, uh, behind Straub. Straub with 200 to go. And he's away off the front, and here goes Ovet starting to move up. Coe is starting his sprint now, and it's between these three, the three class men of the field. Coe hits the front, looks around, and he's got Ovet on his shoulder. And now this is the test. He's got two metres on him, and Ovet's going to have to sprint all the way here. Coe's away at the front, and it looks as if Coe's going to do it. Coe is going to win the 1,500 metres, and Ovet's going to get only a bronze medal. A fantastic run by Coe. He's done it. He's got the gold. In second place, Straub, and Ovet just left it too late. He ran it right off the front, the last lap there of about 52.3 and he cannot believe it a fantastic run after the misery of last weekend when he lost in the 800 and now everything is back and golden again Steve grins he's not taking it badly well there that was unbelievable all credit to him to come back from such a psychological low to the bashing that he took in the 800 meters and he can't believe that he's dancing up and down on the back straight he shook us all he made it out to the front. We all waited for Ovet to take his kick, to come off the bend, to run back at him. We expected them to be stride for stride. I think if he'd have been beaten in the 15 by myself or Straub or someone like that, um, the world would have just said, well, Seb's a failure. A horrible thing to actually uh, to do, but they would have done, there's no doubt about it. I mean, the press were actually loading the guns, waiting to fire them almost on that particular day. When I lost 
an eight, my, the 800 meter final in Moscow. I had lost an 800 meter final. It didn't matter whether Steve was black, brown, or, you know, it, it didn't matter where he came from. It was just the fact that I'd lost it. And uh, the fact that it was him that had beaten me was construed in other quarters as being very important to me. It was totally insignificant. I don't know much about Seb. Um, I don't live and breathe him. I don't wake up every morning with his picture above my bed, throwing darts at it, that type of thing, or I, I don't think about him when I'm running. It, it doesn't matter to me um, that we haven't raced that much. I think that's, in many ways, I suppose, part of the mystique. I don't really know the guy. Uh, we've always had the problem of having lived in very distinct, different parts of the country. Um, yes, I know Seb's failings. Yes, I know my own failings. I'm, I'm not going to tell you, though. Um, uh, but I also appreciate his good points, um, and mine as well. As a youngster, I had the two best middle distance runners in the world ahead of me and was able to learn so much from them, not just by talking to them, but by just by watching them, just by being in the same races as them, um, by seeing how uh, they handled the media or, or didn't handle the media, um, all the pressures that go with it, um, all the other things you have to do. And for me, it was, it was a marvellous learning period. <laughs> Having trailed in the shadows of Steve Ovette and Sebastian Coe at the Moscow Olympics, a third young Briton from Jarrow in the north of England started to make his mark in the 1980s. His name, Steve Cram. For people like Steve and Seb, it probably is a little bit difficult though, to have somebody from your own country who, um, at first you see as a young 17, 18 year old who shows a bit of promise, but you know you don't know whether he's going to get there or not. And then you know four or five years later, you find that the same youngster is. Um, is beating you or is, or is pushing you hard because it, apart from anything else it, you know, it obviously shows that you're getting older. Slowly eroding the co ovette supremacy of the early 1980s, Steve Cram was to take the Commonwealth, European and World 1500 metre titles to establish his own reputation. Only at the Los Angeles Olympics did he falter, taking a silver to Coe's gold. Then, in the summer of 1985, Cram went for his first genuine solo world record attempt, the 1500 metres, in Nice, France. A new era of middle distance running and dominance was about to begin. And here goes Steve Cram, bidding for glory from the bell, just as he said he was. But he is a weeter moving through too, and Gonzalez looks to his side and sees the little Moroccan coming up quickly. Can Cram hold on? Has he the strength? The world record is in his sights. And look at how great athletes are struggling in their wake. There's Scott, there's Cruz, well out of it. Cram in superlative form. This is the Steve Cram that won the world title and the Commonwealth title. But a Wheater is getting close to him all the way. A Wheater, the great sprinter. Can Cram hold on in the home straight? What a fantastic run this is by Steve Cram. Here comes a Wheater, though. Can Cram hold on? A Wheater's pursuing him right to the line. And Cram does it, and the time is 3.29.66. The first time in history that anyone has run 1,500 metres in less than 3 minutes 30. A fantastic new world record for Steve Cram, and he's decimated one of the finest fields ever assembled. Steve Cram tonight is on top of the pile. For me, it was a very, very special moment because... Um, the first world record for anybody, I think, is, is, is extra special. Um, but it had come in a race where I wasn't just running with pacemakers and against the clock. It had come in, in, in a race against a Wheater who, um, you know, obviously the, he ran such a fast time as well. People are going to consider as, as one of the best 1500 metre runners around. And I think for the, for the people watching the race, it, it provided much more of a spectacle and a lot of them weren't actually watching the clock. I mean, it was one of those occasions when people were actually watching the race and watching the week catching me and will he get me, will he not, can I hang on, cross the line and then look at the clock and see it's a new world record as well. And there aren't many occasions when you get that sort of thing happening. Um, it's usually more a case of, you know, 200 to go, can he run the last 227 seconds or something, or 28, and 
counting the clock down as they come to the line. So for me, it was, it was nice to get the world record in that respect, but also winning the race was special. When I went to Oslo, I was probably in a much more confident mood than I had been, say, uh, going into Nice. I mean, I, I had Nice and the 1500 metre world record behind me. I'd also run a very, very good race in, in Edinburgh four or five days before that and was very pleased with the speed that I showed in that race. So I went into Oslo feeling very, very confident. But to be perfectly honest, I, I didn't have any thoughts or, or very few thoughts about the world record. For me, the main thing was to beat Seb and that was all that counted. Co, who holds six world records, 800 metres, 1,000 metres indoors and out, the mile and the four by 800 metres, which he holds, ironically, jointly with Steve Cram. Cram, the 24-year-old from Jarrow, born in Gateshead, his dad, a former policeman, and his mum are here, and tonight is the night of their wedding anniversary as well. So what a celebration it will be in the Cram household if he beats Seb Co, and if, dare we say it, he approaches Co's world record. 347.33. Cram at six foot two and an eleven and a half stone, considerably bigger and heavier than this man, Sebastian Coe. Coe with that fantastic ability to accelerate again off a pace that's already too hot for most. But Cram too has proved and proved spectacularly in Nice eleven days ago that he has that ability too. Fourteen men in the field then, and they also include Steve Cram wearing number ninety, as you can see. Steve Scott of the United States of America, number two on the all-time list. James Mays, all in white, and there's a faller right at the beginning. James Mays, all in white, as Delise of Switzerland went down in the rush. Mays, and hopefully none of the others will have been uh, put off at all by that. Mays, the 800-meter man from the United States of America, has been asked to set the pace for the first 1,000 meters. Then Hillard of Australia will take over. That's the game plan. And I know that both Cram and Co were slightly concerned that maybe things had been a little too prearranged, and if there were too many men asked to set the pace in front of them, it might make their job more difficult. Cram, you can see, buried in the pack, Co in fourth place, and Mays has let them off very quickly with the Australian Hillard just behind him. Co's time when he set the world record at 440 yards was 55.3. Mays leads then. Hillard is second. Cram has moved through the third. And Co now has changed places with him, so to speak, in the pack. Ron Clark. I think uh, that just the fact he's two seconds off the pace because he went through and ran 57 doesn't matter too much because. Uh, Cram can pick that up easily. I, I thought it very interesting that Cram was the one that took the brave split step and went after them. Co was in a position to stay close to Hillard and tucked in in third, but he stayed back. He's, and he's still well back in the field. He seems to be gambling that Cram may go too hard too early. Mays of America leads all in white. Number four in green is the Australian Hillard. Then in third place it's Steve Cram. Abdi Billy of Somalia, all in black is four. Co is fifth. The 880-yard time in Coe's world record was 1 minute 53.3, and you can see they're just outside that. But plenty of men capable of whipping up the pace again on this vital third lap. So that world record still on target as Mays continues to lead. And Coe significantly has moved through to follow Cram. Mays leads, Hillard second, Cram third, Co fourth, as Mays steps out. And now it's crucial if the world record is to be achieved that Hillard can continue to keep the pace going. Number 142, just behind uh, Co there is Jose Luis Gonzalez, and then just behind him, the American Steve Scott. So it's Hillard, Cram, Co, Gonzalez, and Scott. And they have broken away from the rest at the bell. The time at the bell, 2.53, their outside world record pace. But the confrontation now takes over from the clock. Cram has got 300 metres to go, and Cram has taken the lead. He had two options here to decide to leave it to 200 to go or to go early. And in the brave style he has adapted so often, and so successfully, Cram has gone early. 
Scott is moving through into third place, and Gonzalez moving through too. And it's Cram who stretches away. And Gonzalez is coming up and overtaking Coe. There's the world record time in the corner of the screen. That was the 1500 meter time, but Cram with 50 meters to go is going to beat him and beat the world record, yes! Cram has done it again. A fantastic achievement. And Steve Cram has rewritten the record books for the second time in 11 days. The 1,500 metres world record went to him in Nice. Tonight in Oslo, Cram gets a new world record in the mile and beats Sebastian Coe into the bargain and gets himself a permanent place in the history books. He's beaten the man they said was the greatest miler of them all and he's beaten him in a new world record. His time for that final lap, a staggering 53.16 said was obviously very very disappointed I was very elated um, and it wasn't until we got away from the television cameras a little bit um, that he came and said congratulations and well done I think if it's nobody ever sits back and says okay that's it you know I, I got beat today you've won uh, you've won the, you've broken my world record that's it you know I'm finished I mean I mean, imagine the first thoughts going through his mind were right just wait until I get another chance I'm going to I'm going to come back and beat you and, and get my record back if I can. Um, I don't think any athlete worth his salt will, will ever give in and say, you know, that's the end of uh, my dominance, that's the end of uh, my chances of breaking a world record. Any athlete who is still running and still competing at that top level has got to believe that he can still go out there and do it again, still go out and break records. Steve Cram then, surrounded by well-wishers... But I think if I'd finished my career without having actually broken the mile world record or the 1500 meter world record then I would have felt as though something was lacking. I mean I'm not saying I've finished yet but um, it's filled a little void that I have. You have to want to win. In a race, if there are ten of you standing on the start line, there are nine guys who think they can win and one guy who knows he's going to win. And quite often it comes down to that in the end. Well, I think three and a half minutes is conceivable. That is based on physiological principles of how much oxygen the lungs can breathe in and out and the blood can transport. I confess completely that in 1954, I could not have conceived a mile being run in uh, 347. I would have been prepared to bet very big money that that was impossible. So I don't intend to make a prediction for the year 2000. My standard always was that if you took the world record for 880 yards today and you doubled it, um, beyond that it would be impossible to do it. We still overprotect ourselves. We still stop that last drain, that, that, that challenge to death, if you like. I can see someone possibly averaging 55 seconds per quarter mile possibly in the long, long distance future, maybe by the year 2000. And that would correspond to about a 340 mile. Uh, I really don't think I will ever see a mile run under 340. Mais il me semble que d'ici 10 ans, le record du monde du mile sera à 3 minutes 45 secondes. To run faster by the year 2000, we're going to have to see some milers who are going to run, you know, very, very well at uh, 400 meters, maybe, uh, uh, you know, close to a, a world record pace, and yet they can carry that on and out and run a 1,500-mile uh, world record. They're going to have to have that kind of versatility. I think in the year 2000, I see people will be flying. And they're getting stronger, they're getting bigger, they're getting faster, they're becoming more fluent. And I think what will happen is that the athletes will become more scientific. We'll probably be finding that we get excited about a world record being broken by three minutes of a second in the year 2000. Um, all these things occur, and uh, I think it would be fascinating. I'd love to be around, uh, hopefully, touch wood, to watch it all happen. The improvement in the mile will come from the early part of the race, not the latter part. I think the latter part of the race is just a matter of maintaining, maintaining the same kind of speed that, um, that you actually launch out with from the gun. If you're going to look forward to the year 2000, I think 340 is a distinct possibility. I mean, it's only 
it's four laps of 55 seconds, um, which we're not too far away from, from doing, really. A fantastic achievement. And Steve Cram has rewritten the record books for the second time in 11 days. The 1,500 metres world record went to him in Nice. Tonight in Oslo, Cram gets a new world record in the mile and beats Sebastian Coe into the bargain and gets himself a permanent place in the history books. He's beaten the man they said was the greatest miler of them all and beaten him in a new world record.